Hi everyone, in today's video we're going to have a look at the maths content for the product design A-level exams. So as you know, 15% of the questions is going to be applied maths. So it is very much applied maths as opposed to just like standard maths. So it, normally it will give you like a context of a question and then the thing most people say they struggle with a little bit is understanding what it's actually physically asking you. So I'm going to go through basically the kind of maths that you need to know and then some examples as we're going through. I have put together a playlist on the YouTube channel already of where I've taken a couple of videos from other um, channels that go through things like trigonometry and ratios to explain in more detail as well. So basically, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the most common things, the most likely thing you need to know for the exam. So things like using numbers and percentages, calculating ratios, calculating surface areas and volumes, trigonometry, use and analysis of graphs and charts, plotting coordinates and geometry on graphs, and then anthropometrics and probability. So those are the most common ones. A lot of what comes up is numbers and ratios, uh, sorry, uh, numbers, surface areas, and trigonometry, like the most common ones. Um, and remember as well, you always have to make sure you're showing your market, you're working out, because those are what you get extra marks as well. So you can get the working out right, or the theory behind it right, but end up with the wrong answer and still get some of the marks. Okay, so we're gonna go through some examples. I'm going to flip back and forth across a few slides quite a lot just so you can see what we're going through. So a couple of um, questions to look through. So we look at numbers and percentages first. So you might be asked to use percentages to work out things like costing, materials, production, wastage of material, uh, measurements, mass, area, volume, density, speed, time, temperature, force. There's like, it could be any sort of context to it, but typically be numbers and percentages. Okay, so... This is materials use and production costs. So our printing company uses 11,000 litres of ink per day for one week. Think is used in the following percentages. So it's showing you how much ink, how much percentage per day per colour. Okay, so for a week being five day week, Monday to Friday. How many litres of black are used during this week? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to next slide, I'm going to show you the workings out for it, and then we're going to flip flop between so you can see why we've done it. So first of all, how many litres of black are used during the week? So we look through step one, calculate the total number of ink used over the week. So I've done five times 11,000. So why have I done five times 11,000 first of all? Well, because it says a total is they use 11,000 litres of ink per week total. Okay, so... How many days in the week? Well, we just said that. Monday to Friday, that's five days. So calculate how much ink is used in the week. It's five times 11,000, gives you 55,000. Then calculate the, the amount of black ink used in one week. So what we've got here, so we've got 40, 30, 60, 40, 55. So why have I got that? So if you look here, 40, 30, 60, 40, 55, that is the percentages of the amount used in the week. So adding all of those up. Then divided by 100, at 100, at 100, at 100, at 100. So why have I got that in? Well, obviously, as a total, you can only have a total of 100%. That's how percentages work. So basically, add up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So add up 500. Okay, and then add all the totals up there. So this here is the, amount, the total amount of black used. This is then the total number, total percentage of all uh, ink used totally. So that is... 225 divided by 500 and then all multiplied by the total amount of litres. So first of all you would add all the black up, add all of the amount of paint using total. Then times that by 550, uh, 55,000 sorry, and that gets you a total of 24,750. So you can use that to calculate any. So you could do exactly the same. I haven't got the workings out for it but if you were to say for example figure out how many litres of uh, cyan we used in the week. So the theory would be exactly the same. So you would add 20, add 40, add 10, add 25, add 15. Add that all up together. And then obviously you would still do 500 because you've still got 100% uh, per day. So add those together. Uh, divide, by, so, so add all the numbers of cyan together. So 20, 40, 10, 25, 15, add all that together. Then divide that by 500 and then times that by 55. Now, obviously, what you could do as well, we could change the amount of litres used per day as well. So we could say, for example, uh, 15 litres. So then what we do is obviously you go back to the original step, 
So five days, and we, we turn that by 15,000 as opposed to 11,000. So there's loads of variables you, that you can do. But obviously, if you're figuring out how many uh, liters are used of one color, find out the total liters used for all colors, and then figure out the difference that way. So not an overly difficult thing to work out. The thing people tend to like struggle with is like the actual workings out of it and then actually what it's asking you to work out as well. So it will always give you all the information you need. It's worth spending the time just properly reading through, underlining or highlighting what the key bits of information that you need are, uh, and then working it out that way. Okay, so express the amount of yellow ink in the, uh, to the amount of magenta ink used over the week as a ratio. Okay, so we're going to look at ratios now. So this could be part B of the same question. Okay, so again, I'm going to flip-flop between the two so you can see what's going on. So step one, top percent of yellow used over the week. All right, so I've done 35, 20, 15, 15, and 20. So why have I done that? Again, really simple. 35, tw oh, that is. 35, 20, 15, 15, 20. So adding all those up of yellow. Okay. And then again, dividing by 500. Why are we dividing by 500? Because with total percentages per day can only equal 100 because you can only have 100%. Okay. So that gives you 21%. Step two, total percent of magenta used over the week. So 5, 10, 15, 20, and 10. So why have we got that? Again, if you look magenta, 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, and 10%. Same again, so add that up, divide it by 500, gets you 12. So as a ratio, you could just write 21 to 12, okay? However, with ratios, you need to write it as the lowest, like the simplest form possible. So the smallest numbers that you can get them at. So what you can do for the 21, what's my mask going out there? 21 and 12. So basically, what can go into both of them? So three can go in both of those. So 21 divided by three gets you seven. 20, uh, 12 divided by three gets you four. So that'd be a, a ratio of seven to four. You can't make that any smaller because no other numbers go into those that way. Okay, so ratios actually are really, really simple. Um, the same would be, again, you could literally pick any of those colours. You could say the ratio of black to cyan, and again, you would do the same. You would add all the percentage up, so 40, 30, 60, 40, 55. Divide it up by 500, you get to see what the percentage would be. And then, same with cyan, and then you get your ratio of it, and then, you, again, you've got to divide it down to get a smaller number as possible. If you just had step one and step two, so these bits here, and then the big bit, you wouldn't get the full marks, but you would get the marks for the working out, but you have to end up with the smallest but the simplest possible form, okay? And on the reverse of that, if you just put the answer down straight away, because you can do it, because some people, particularly if you're doing A-level maths or physics, and your maths is really high level, um, if you just put the straight away the answer, you'll just get the mark for the answer. You won't get the mark for the, the workings out that go with it as well. So please do make sure, even if you're really, really confident in your maths, make sure you're showing your working out as you're going along. So next, the firm is looking at the process to reduce ink usage by 10%. If all ink colours cost £1.25 per litre, what would their total savings be over a four-week period? So again, I'm going to flip-flop between the two and we'll see what's going on. So, so in four weeks, the firm uses so 55,000 litres. So where have we got that from? Well, if you remember all the way back originally, they said that they would use 11,000 a day. So that was right at the beginning, if I jump all the way back. Yep, so it says 11,000 a day. And then obviously a five-day working week. So that gives you 55,000. So for four weeks... So times that by four gives you 220,000 litres of ink over a four week period. So step two, get, find 10% of this, because it's asking us, uh, trying to reduce it by 10%, so we need to figure out what the 10% of that is. So 10% of this, okay, so the simplest way to find out percentages of something, so you've got 22, uh, 220,000, sorry, and times that by 0.1, that gives you 10%. Same if it was 20, 30, 40, doing 0.2, 0.3, .2, that kind of thing. So 10% of that gets you 22,000. All right, and then it tells us that ink costs £1.25 per litre. So we know that we're trying to save 22,000. So 22,000 times £1.25 gets you 27,500, which will be 
the answer to my question, which is they're looking at the total savings over a four week period. So if they were to save those 10%, so 10% of the total used would equal 27,500 pounds. And the same again, so you could do, we could ch we could completely change this up. So we could change, so we're gonna do it over a six week period and we're gonna say it's gonna be two pound 40 a litre. And say, for example, they wanna change that to say they wanna reduce the ink usage by 25% or 20%. And literally it's simply a case of, once you know the formula, just change those numbers round and work it out that way. So if the scenario particularly struggling with, please just, again, pause the video, just change the numbers around a bit, so maybe change the percentage of ink they're trying to save, change how much the litre costs, change how many weeks they're trying to save it for, and just sort of calculate it out that way. Okay, so we're gonna move on a little bit now. So, work example, so volumes. So an injection mould for a dice has a cavity of 20 by 20 by 20 mil. Once cooled, the component shrinks along its linear length by 10%. Calculate the percentage reduction in the volume between the mould and the component. Okay, so, again, I'm going to flip flop between this. Step two, the cavity volume is 20 by 20 by 20. So we're literally just taking the top bit along here, first of all. So that equals 8,000 millimetres cubed. Then reduce the linear length. So the linear length reduces by 10%. So... 20 times 0.9 gets you 18 because we're basically re we're removing, sorry, I can't talk, 10% of it. So basically we're trying, we're trying to find 90% uh, of it. So 90% of 20 is 18 millimetres. So we said the length of 10% is smaller than it's called. So 90% of or 0 0.9 of its original size. So step three uh, is figuring out the component size when it's called. So rather than doing 20 by 20 by 20, it'll be 18 by 18 by 18 which gives us 5,832. So then the volume reduction, so simply subtract uh, 5,832 from 8,000, which gives you 2,168. And then it did ask it as a percentage, so calculate the percentage reduction. So this is where you make sure you read the question carefully, please, not the actual, because that's where most people, they'll do all the workings out, they just either will not put it in the right unit at the end, okay? so. It will then, to obviously, to get it as a percentage times 100, it gets you uh, a percentage of 27.1%. So, other ways you could do this, uh, move this around. So, you could uh, say it shrinks by 15%. Okay, and then you would do that by uh, times it by 0 0.85, and that'll give you uh, what 80% is. Same way, what you could do is you could change the overall sizes to begin with, you could change uh, the, the original size and you could reduce it down that way. So as long as you make sure you basically figure out the volume of the current size, figure out the volume of the, the shrunk size, figure out the difference and then turn it into a percentage. So tolerances. So again, another worked example. The ideal speed for a rotation for a specific drill is 800 RPM. Uh, although it's acceptable for it to run between 780 and 820 RPM. Express the acceptable tolerance as a percentage. So we, you should have an idea of what tolerance is. So tolerance is, if something's supposed to be 800, it will be okay if it was 780 or it was 820. So that's sort of like the, the window that will be acceptable. Outside of that, it's not working as we want it to work. Okay? So express the acceptable volumes as a percentage. So you take maximum RPM, Minus minimum RPM is acceptable tolerance. So 820 minus 780. So all we're literally taking it from there. The question 780 uh, and 820. So that is 40. So 40 divided by 800. So where have we got the 800 from? So 800 is the original speed. So all we're doing is the tolerance divided by 800 and times it by 100 to turn it into a percentage because that's how you do it. Gives you five percent now because it, the percentage is plus and minus, so it's above and below the original um, desired speed. You do a little plus and minus sign, and then you'd half it, so it'd be plus or minus two point five. So tolerances are really really simple to work. Um, they do like to throw this in there. Typically, actually, normally they actually do it as a, a multiple choice question, which is even better, um, but really simple. Just figure out what the overall tolerance is, what the difference is. So the, the highest tolerance and the lowest tolerance. 
divide it by uh, the original ideal speed and then figure out the percent tens by hundreds figure the percentage and then half it above and below. Okay, so going back to ratios a little bit more as well. So a concrete casting is produced using the following ratios. Sand, cement, water, and aggregate. And that gives you the exact measurements there. Express the ratios using only whole numbers. And two, the casting requires 30 litres of concrete. How much aggregate is required? So what we're going to do, so ratio is 3 to 1 to 0.5 to 1.5. Okay, so all we've done is take those, 3, 1, 0.5, 1.5. So all we've done is rearrange it and laid it out how we would rate, lay it out in a ratio. So we need to get rid of the decimal places. So it says right here, express the ratio using only whole numbers. Okay, so the best, the, the, again, the simplest and lowest numbers you can do is times that by 2. So you get 6, 2, one and three so there's no other way we can't make one a smaller number that's the smallest number we can do it on the smallest whole number and that would be that nice and simple so question number two the cast here requires 30 liters of concrete how much aggregate is required so take our whole number ratio here six two one three so there are three liters of aggregate in, aggregate in total so six two one three uh, 12 units of, li of liquid so you add it all together so 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so it gives you a total of 12 units of liquid. So this is 3 twelfths or a quarter of the liquid. So again, we look at aggregate. So here, aggregate was our last one. So we've got 3 here. So 3, three, from, um, three over 12, a quarter. And the total liquid is 30 litres. To find the proportion of the, of the aggregate, you need to multiply the proportion within the total. So 3 over 12, which is how much it is in our ratio for question 1, and times that by 30 litres, because that's how much it's asking us to figure out from. So that is a quarter times 30, which gives you 7.5 litres. Um, it's probably worth noting as well, in things like this, those that do the maths, uh, A-level or physical, level, you, your maths is probably better, you probably find out faster, easier ways to figure this out as well. That's absolutely fine. I'm just taking it as I would attack these questions. There's always several different ways of working things out as well. So if you've got an easier way, you think, by all means, please uh, use the way you're comfortable with doing as well. But if you're someone that is um, not doing that and your math is okay, but you sort of like some of this is good revision for you, this is just the way I personally would go about doing it. Okay, so just calculating surface areas and volume. So basically, like, Relatively simple, in fact, very, very simple. This is, you should be doing this in like year seven or eight, but these are like typically how you figure out the sort of like surface areas and volumes of basic shapes. Now, annoyingly, as you'll see in a few more of my slides, um, my pi symbol has disappeared, which is why I've got this little question mark in a box. That's supposed to be the pi symbol, but annoyingly it's disappeared. But from now on, just assume it's the pi symbol. Okay, so simple things like doing rectangle squares, uh, triangles and then circles. Remember, you will be allowed to have a calculator in your exam. In fact, you won't be able to do the exam properly without a calculator, but it won't give you uh, formulas. So you need to know things like pi r squared or like like things like that. And then again, just to sort of help you with like the volumes of things. But hopefully these aren't new to you. I won't go into a great deal because everything you need to know literally is on this slide. So I'll just give you a minute. Please do pause the video, make notes as well. But it's making sure you can understand. So pi r squared times height for things like volumes of cylinders, four times uh, area for cubes. So it's, it's all, like I said, this is before GCSE style maths. And I, I don't want to like... In, um, and sort of anyone by going over really, really basic things, but please do make sure you at least have this in your brain. Okay, so, so is there a volume question? If the outer circle has a radius of 30 millimeters and the inner hole has a radius of 20 millimeters, what is the cross sectional area of the ring? Okay, so again, I'm going to flip flop between the two and we'll go through it and see what we're doing. So, area of the ring is area. Oh, that should be area, so ignore my spell mistake there. Uh, area of a circle without the hole. 
minus area of the hole. Okay, so we're trying to find the cross-sectional bit. So set one, find the area of the circle without the hole. So that will be uh, what we're after. Uh, take square. Okay. So area of the whole school, um, circle first. So we're on the whole thirty. So we've got this there. Again, apologies. That should be pi. So pi times thirty squared. So that gets you two thousand eight hundred twenty-six. Now what you will see in all marking schemes, there is like I've talked about torus before. Because pi will be slightly different depending on how many decimal points you use and which calculator you're using. So when I do my mark scheme thing, it basically I've written it how it will come up in the mark scheme. This would be within anything within that would be the acceptable tolerance with your pi um, calculation on your calculator because it depends obviously on how many decimal points and how much you round up and that type of thing. Okay, so area of the circle without the hole, so pi uh, times 30 squared gets you that. Find the area of the hole, so why we've got 20, well, because the hole size is 20 millimeters, so same again, pi times 20 squared. Okay, which gets you 1,256. So then all you do is area of the ring is subtract them both like that. So again, how do we mix it up? Same thing, it, really easy. You could change those measurements to that could be 40, 50, 10, whatever you want, and 15. And you can just change it as long as you can figure out the area of the circle with the hole, area of the circle, uh, sorry, area circle. Without the hole, area circle. With the hole, subtract the difference. Okay, and again, uh, why have I got these tolerances here? Again, it's because because we've used pi and because calculators are going to be slightly different. That will be within the, the accepted tolerance. As a general rule of thumb, as well, uh, it wants you to round up to one decimal place. Um, you don't want to have multiple decimal points. Uh, at the end, um, but you do you never, unless it states specifically to make a whole number, typically it's a good idea just to keep it at to one decimal point. Okay, calculate the volume of geometrical, uh, geometric forms. To calculate the volume of a cuboid or, or cubic cuboid, you multiply height, width, and depth. Again, we talked about surface areas and volumes before, so I don't want to go in too much because it, it's quite a simple. One. So when calculate the volume of any prism, triangle, rectangle, hexagonal, or cylindrical, there are two stages. So calculate the cross-sectional area, so the 2D area version of it, and multiply the cross-sectional area by the height or the length of the shape. So it's a prism there, but it could be any shape. So when it says about the cross-section, basically you're figuring out... That's my mouse. There it is. Sorry, my mouse keeps disappearing. So calculate the cross-sectional area first, so that would be the 2D area first of the 2D shape, and then whatever the length or the height is. Okay, and again, sorry, my pi symbol has disappeared there. So you figure out the cross-sectional area and then that gives you the surface, the the, um, the area of that surface and then the volume of it is compared times that by whatever the, the height or the length of it that thing is. So find the volume of a cylinder with a radius of 25 and a height of 50. So again, I'm gonna flip flop between the two. So the cross-section area of a cylinder is a circle. Therefore, what we're looking at is pi r squared. Everyone should know pi r squared. It should be in the brain forever and ever and ever. Okay, so pi r squared. So what is r? So it's given as a radius. It might give you a diameter, and then you've got to figure out the, the radius from that, which is obviously you just half it. So cross-section area, so pi times 25 squared, which gives you uh, between one, uh, 1,962 and a half, yeah, 1,963 or 1,963.75 mil. So the volume of uh, the cylinder is cross-sectional area times the height. So we've got the cross-section area, because obviously cylinder and the cross-section of that is a circle. So pi r squared gets us what the area of that circle is. And to get the volume, just times it by the height. So the height is what? The height is 50, right there. So just times this number that you got, times that by 50, and that is how you get your volume. So that would be between 98,125 uh, or 98,175.5. It's really hard to say some of these long numbers. Okay, so surface area and volume. Not an only complicated one, Kate one, but obviously you just need to be able to know things like pi r squared, or figure out what, what, what arc radiuses and things like that are as well. Okay, so uh, areas and volume scale factors. So you maybe have to increase or decrease a length, area, or volume of a shape. So it may give you, like, like we talked about before with the dice and it's shrinking and that type of thing. 
So it will typically only be for rectangular or cuboid forms. When changing the surface area of a rectangle, you may be given a percentage increase or decrease and asked to figure out the new length. So like with that dice one where it gave us it and it said it's been reduced by 10%, that type of thing. So the most common mistake is if you just reduce each side by 50%, you end up with a surface area of 1,000, uh, which is a 25% decrease overall. So what we're going to go through. So the rectangle is 50 by 80, given a surface area volume of 4,000. Okay, if I want to reduce the surface area by 50%, how long would each side be? So we're going to flip-flop between the two. So calculate the area scale factor. So this is expressed as a decimal, which we take from the new size the question wants. So that's 50%. So the scale factor is 0.5. So this is like if you're doing um, technical drawing and your scale factor, like how much are you reducing the drawing by for the, for the actual model, that type of thing. So hopefully scale factors aren't brand new to you. So reducing it by 50%. Where my mouse there is. So 50%, so scale factor of 0.5. So then step two, now we have the scale factor, we need the length scale factor. So just apply the square root to the scale factor. So square root of 0 0.5 is 0 0.707, and then there is more points to that. Uh, calculate the new length of each side. So that is original length times the length scale factor. And then calculate the new surface area from that. So the length, so we can take our length, say that's 800. And then we can just times that by our length scale factor, which is 0. Uh, 707 so you keep that in your calculator and do it that way okay so trigonometry so I'm gonna go over a very basic bit of trigonometry here with a worked example <coughs> excuse me um, on the YouTube channel I have put um, I found some really good videos from other YouTube channels that I've taken over to explain trigonometry in a lot more detail so trigonometry which typically this is the area a few more people struggle with that explain that that whole video is just twenty minutes of just explaining trigonometry. So if this is a particular area where you're a bit unsure of, please go back to that video and have a look. Okay. So simply put, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. C squared is the square root of a squared plus b squared. That's sort of like the simply way to kind of remember uh, sort of things. Obviously, this is like if it's the other problem with questions like this, it's never as straightforward as. Um, like a math question, it's given a context. So typically this sort of context down here for the worked example. So when designing a chair, a frame is produced out of steel tube. A C is to fit along B, C. It's the length of B, C down here. Uh, the designer must calculate the length of the board needed for this. And they know the depth of the chair AB. So they know that length there. So they know that is 400 and the seat should drop 100 mil along A, C. So a C there. So we know what the length across A B is and we know what the length across A C is. So express your answer to the nearest millimeter. So again I'm going to flip flop between the two slides to show you what we're going through. So we need to find B C. Okay so we know what A B is and we know what A C is. So hopefully again I'm kind of assuming we've got a basic idea of what I'm saying. So if it sounds a bit confusing with what I'm saying with A B or B C or A C it's literally the distance from B to C, so that length along there, or A, B, so the length across there to there. That's where these terms are coming through. I know that sounds quite simple, but I just want to make sure no one's getting left left behind. Okay, so we need uh, B, C. That was my foot on the chair, by the way. Okay, so B, C squared, so that is A, B squared plus A, C squared. So we already know those measurements here, so 400 and 100. So 400 squared plus 100 squared, so that gives you 160,000 plus 10,000. So that then gives you 170,000. So we then know, obviously, C is the square root of A squared plus B squared. So we are then going to do BC will be the square root of 170,000, and that then means BC will be 412 millimetres. Okay, so when... Obviously, there are people that are really, really like good at maths that can do their trigonometry dead simple. Um, and you would probably do this in, with your calculator without really marking it out so you knowing it because you can just sort of figure it out. For me, when I'm doing the question, when I'm answering it, these are the, the parts I'd write down. So typically, that's what you get the marks for. You would get a mark for saying that you know that BC, to figure out BC, you need AB and AC squared. 
or AB squared, sorry, plus AC squared. So that gets you a mark. Then putting that with the calculate with the measurements you've been given gets you the next mark. Then doing so that's what I mean about you can put all your marks in and still get the wrong answer and still get some of the marks. If you, for example, as well, end up with the wrong calculations here, but you already figured out that it was AB squared plus AC squared equals, and then moved it and then figured out it was a square root, you would still get some more marks, even though part of it was wrong as well. So that's why it's really important to make sure you are putting this working out down. Okay. So again, just a little simple bit about trigonometry. This is explained really, really well in that other YouTube channel I just talked about. So please, again, if trigonometry is an area, particularly you think you need a little bit more help on, please do go back and have another look on it as well. It's just a case of keep practicing different examples as you go through. So probability. Okay, so another worked example. So an electrical manufacturer tests 1,000 identical machines. The motors on two machines fail after 500 washes and the belt drives of 25 machines fail after 500 washes. Both outcomes were independent of each other, so they happen separately and one doesn't cause the other. Okay, What is the probability of a machine suffering from both issues? Okay, So, probability of a motor failure, so 2 divided by 1000, so why have we got that? Well it says right there, the motors fail on 2000 after 500 washes. Okay, and this is on a thousand machines, so two over a thousand, probably a drive, uh, a drive belt failure. Where do we get that 25 from? It tells us again, right there, 25. So this is what I'm on about sometimes where it's making sure you can pick the key information out of the question. So obviously there's quite a lot of wording there, but actually you've got to make sure you're picking out the key bits that you need from the questions. Okay, so two over a thousand, 25 over a thousand. So Probability of both failures, so 2 over 1,000 times 25 over 1,000 gets you 5 over 100,000, which you then divide that, that gives you 1, so figure that out, is 1 every uh, 20,000 is when that will happen. So we literally, I've just taken that, 5 divided by 100,000 gets you 1 over 20,000. Okay, so... Now we're going to a little bit different. So this is coordinates and geometry. They like these sort of questions with things like anthropometrics and ergonomics and that type of thing. Uh, there's a few laser cutting questions and this sort of thing. So CNC coordinates have been used to create the program required to laser cut apart from sheet aluminium. Now, I mean, technically speaking, you won't be using a laser cut of a sheet aluminium, but we'll gloss over that little bit there. Um, plot the coordinates on the grid below and use the calculate the total area of the part. So CNC coordinates, 30, 20, 80, 20, 80, 70, 60, 70, 40, 50, 20, 50, 30, 20. So, actually, I think I'm not actually going to explain this bit to you. So, this pretty simple, just literally match out where you reckon they're going to go. So, pause the video a second, just see if you can map out where you think that will go. And then I'm going to flip over and I want to see if you got that to where you thought it would be. Okay, so hopefully you ended up with a shape like this. Okay, so all you're doing, so across the bottom, the bottom is always the first one, okay? So go to 30, go up to 20, okay? So if you go, literally go across 30, up to 20, okay? 80 to 20, so across, go to 80, go up to 20. Go across to 80, go up to 20. Go across to 80, up to 70. Go across to 80, up to 70. So you see where we're plotting these out. As long as you make sure you've got the bottom, the first number is across the bottom, the second number is across the side. So pretty simple. So then plot the coordinates grid and then use this to calculate the total area of the part. Okay. So first of all, that's the part we're laser cutting apparently. So now we need to figure out the area of that part. So plot coordinates correctly. So this is taken for the mark scheme as well. So plot coordinates gets you one mark, so that then draw lines to define the shape. So you get a mark for just putting the dots first of all. Then to draw the actual lines to make up the shape gets you the second mark. So any rectangular area uh, calculated correctly. So it's how you separate it all out. So personally this is how I would separate it out. So you'd have one rectangle, a square and two triangles. And that's what you'd start to measure it all out. So this is what we've got here. So even tell it's quite simple because it gives you the exact measurements going across. 
uh, there, so those are the rectangular areas we've got going on there. And any uh, uh, triangle or a tra uh, trapezial old area, that's such a hard word to say, area uh, calculated correctly. Uh, and then obviously then you would make sure that you're adding all of it together, which gives you the total volume, total area, sorry, of 2,250 millimeters. So first step is nice and simple as you spot it all out. Now obviously you need to figure out the whole area of that and the easiest way to do it. The reason why we've broken that down is it's a lot easier to figure out the areas of the separate shapes. So me personally I would do the rectangle, the square, and then I'd do the triangle and the triangle. And then I would add it all together and that is your your area as a total. But I left this in here as well because this is a really good way to show you this is what the marking criteria, the mark scheme looks like as someone that marks the exams. Um, and that's how you can see where you get the marks from. So you can see where even if you get the wrong part, wrong final answer, you still end up with several marks. Okay. Figure one shows a stunning workstation. The ideal height for the desktop is level with the elbow height of the users as shown in figure two. Calculate the range of height adjustments required to accommodate the fifth to 85th percentile of the sample shown in the table. The tables above shows the ideal elbow heights, I can't talk anymore, from a range of users, okay? So two marks. So this is lifted from two years ago paper, I think. So it's showing you ideal heights, it's showing you the elbow height and the percentile of the number of people in the sample. Okay, so I'm gonna flip flop between the two. So calculate the 15th percentile. So first of all, cal cal calculate the total in the sample. So add up everyone that's in the sample. So that gives us a total of 200. So then calculate the 15th percentile. So the reason we're doing that is we're trying to go from the 15th to the 85th. So again, flipping between the two, 15th to 85th. So we know there's 220 people in the percentile. Uh, count the 15th of it, so 220 divided by 100, uh, and then it times it by 15, and that gets us 33. And then calculate the 85th percentile, again, where we got that from is up here, so again, 15th to 85th. So we already know total sample is 200. 200 divided by 100, 220, sorry, divided by 100, times by 85. Now the reason we're dividing by, eight, by 100 is to get rid of the percentage of it. We don't want the percentage. So I should have said that before. Um, yeah, we want to work with actual numbers here, not percentiles. So that then gives us a number of 187. So the range from, give the maximum and minimum heights based on the data from the original. So it range from 987 millimeters to 1,137 millimeters or 100 millimeters with work seen. Okay, so you could then separate the distance that way. So, Next one, the table shows the results from a focus group on a new toothbrush design. Using the, this data, calculate the maximum and minimum percentages of 20 to 29 year olds that could have thought the toothbrush was one, good for value, good value for money, and two, clean effectively, show your working. So again, shows you the table, so it shows you the bracket of people are working from, so you're looking at uh, 20 to 29, so this is the area that affects us really. So toothbrush, good value for money, the toothbrush clean effectively. So. So we'll look at maximum first. So total yeses for 2029 20, in both categories. So 10 and 15. So actually, I've just realized I made a little bit of a mistake there. So total yeses for 2029 20, in both categories. That should be 12, not 15. So that's me making a mistake, so I do apologize for that. Um, okay, we'll assume that should be 12, but we'll, we'll work through as we're going through anyway. So add them up together, which is total 25, gets you one mark for that. So then what we're gonna do, total number of 29, uh, 20 to 29 year olds. So we're gonna add how many people are, so 10, add six, add 12, add 14. So again, I don't know where I've got 15 from. I do apologize, everyone. It's rather embarrassing. So basically, wherever there's 15, it should be 12, okay? But for sake, you know what, for argument's sake, let's just say that that 12 there is 15, 
Okay. So total yeses for both, 10 out of 15 is 25. Total number of people that were in this whole thing, so 12, 10 add 6 add 15 add 5, so 10 add 6 add 12, uh, is the total of 36. Uh, set out the equation, so that's what we're after, so percentage of their age equals yeses over how many people in total times by 100. So 25 people said yes in a total of 36 people times by 100 gets you a total of 50%. So total number of yeses for the minimum. So 16, so 6 plus 4. So oh, we're going 6 here plus 4. I don't think I've made a mistake on this one, so I don't feel as bad now. Okay, so 6 plus 4. So obviously that's 10. So 16 minus 10 gives you a total of 6. Total yeses for females. Oh. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Ugh. Ignore what I was saying earlier. I was looking at the wrong thing, sorry. My mistake. So, no, no I was right with the 15. Sorry, I forgot what I was looking at. Okay, so the 10 and the 15, I apologise. That was taken from uh, the females and males. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong the wrong part, so my mistake. So, actually, everything I said about being wrong, ignore that. I am actually right. I am always right. I am amazing. No. Okay, so. So, total number of yeses for males. So, we're adding oh, six and four. Okay, get a total of six. Total yeses for females is five plus three. So, that gives us a total of eight. Minus that by the total number of females gets you uh, 20, uh, gets you 12. Add all the yeses up, gets you 18. And same thing again. So 18 divided by the total number gets you 36, times by 100 gets you 15% as well. And you know that's 15% because you know that 18 times 2 is 36. Okay. Okay, and the last one. So manufacturer of a kitchen furniture which is designed a range of kitchen high stalls. The histogram shows the leg length of sample group of potential users. So calculate the total number of users in the sample group, which of the four bars represents the greatest number of potential users. So histograms are super duper easy, and it's a simpler case of counting up that way. So 70 to 75, so 70 to 75, so it's literally is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, it's that simple, you're just counting up. 75 to 85, 75 to 85. Now, count all the way up to there. So, you know, it's 5, 10, 15, 20 minus 1 is 19. But actually, you see, I've got 36 there. So why is that 36? Well, it's because it's double the width. So it's two lots of people. So it's 19 add 19. Obviously, it gets you your 38. 85 to 90. 85 to 90. So we go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Done. 90 to 100. Oh, wrong way. 90 to 100, 5, and up 1, 6 across 2, gets you your 12. Answer is 75 to 85, because that is the biggest number, gets you one mark. So the total number of users, add them all together, gets you a total number of 90. So that is the end of the examples of the math. I do apologise about getting uh, getting confused about this one. I, I knew I'd worked it out right. For some reason, I just was looking at the wrong little bit. So apart from that, hopefully you've found that not very confusing because that little bit might have thrown you off a bit because I misspoke but yeah as we talked before if I go all the way back to the beginning there we go so those are the things you expected really to know for the math side of things um, it's not overly complicated as I said if the, the main problems people tend to fall into is one misreading the question not understanding exactly what it's asking you to, to talk about or write I'll give the answer for two not necessarily showing your workings out and three, trigonometry tends to be the one bit that tends to throw people off a little bit as well. But as I said before on the video, um, I've got a couple of videos already up on the YouTube channel uh, to explain um, trigonometry. And that whole video is just dedicated to trigonometry. So hopefully, if that's an area you can go back and look on, that'll help that way as well. But um, yeah, what we'll start doing, we'll start working math questions in loads and loads and loads. If you've got any questions, please either send me a message on Teams or email and I'll get back to you.